This is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Orlando versus Martin. Mr. Orlando, it's my understanding that you are suing Miss Martin for severe injuries that you received while a passenger on her boat. You're asking this court to award you past medical expenses of $75,000, future medical expenses of $20,000, pain and suffering of $300,000 for a total award of $395,000. Is that correct? Yes, yes Your Honor. Honor. Okay, Miss Martin, you believe that had Mr. Orlando followed the safety rules that you gave him, he never would have been injured and you all wouldn't be here in court today. True? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. What led you up to the boat ride? Well, Your Honor, me and Mark have been together for 10 years. We've been married for five. We met in college, so it's like your standard love story. Um, we were also fortunate enough to actually meet five really good friends in college as well. Every year, we go on a trip together to kind of recharge. So this is a big deal. Yeah, it's a big... Okay. Every year, we turn up. So we decided to go fishing. I looked online, and I found the Lorelei, which um, Nancy is the captain of. So we hired her to charter our boat to go fishing. That's right up my alley, the right. fishing. I've been fishing since I was four years old. I will fish in a ditch. Good. <laughs> great stuff. Miss <laughs> Martin, tell me about your boat. It's called the Lorelei. It's um, a 58-foot boat. Um, it has two Cummins 450 horsepower engines, diesel engines on it. It's pretty fast. How'd you come to know about boats and, and operating boats? Actually, um, Your Honor, I was in the Navy for 22 years. Mm, I, thank you for your service. Thank you. I, um, I obtained the rank of an 06, which is a senior officer, a captain. My dad taught me to fish like you. When I was four years old, I was out fishing with him all the time. It's my passion. So I knew, like five years before retirement, that I was going to come home and open up a charter fishing business. Tell me about your fishing boat business. What do you do? Um, I take people out on charters. Um, we have a manifest list um, who lists all that's of our That's the real passengers. deal there. There you go. That's it. And that's what you do? You go out and troll for the big fish? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I okay. know where all the sweet spots are. So tell me what happened. So we were winding down. I was actually in a really, really great mood because I had just big, it caught the biggest fish. So I was actually really excited. I had a bunch of adrenaline. Um, we were getting ready to dock. My buddy Carlos was actually on the dock because he stayed back. He was a little bit hungover from the night before. Cause, uh, yeah, fishing and drinking are like kissing cousins. Yeah, she screamed out, welcome home. I assumed that that was what we were, that was, at that point, we were done. We stopped, I was only, there was only like an 18 inch gap. And I'm pretty athletic, I figured I can clear that, no problem. As I get ready to jump, she violently throws the boat in reverse, causing okay. me to lose my footing. At that point, I smashed into the pylon on the dock. And at that point, I was underwater. I was afraid for my life because I felt weak. I could feel the, the, the air leaving my body. And the crazy thing was she actually continued to put the boat in reverse. It wasn't until, you know, she heard the screams of my wife screaming, the other patrons on the boat were actually distraught, that I actually, you know, I had to to pull myself out of the water in pain. Now, Mr. Orlando, you submitted to this court an animation. I want you to go to the plasma screen and take me through this so I know exactly how this happened. Okay, this is how the, the dock is configured that day? Correct. All right, um, now take me through this. So basically, this is the dock and this, my buddy Carlos was about in this area. I'm sorry, Judge. And this is the pylon that I hit right here. Okay. Um, so as she was pulling in, um, like I said, we were all winding down, getting ready to, to get off the boat. She yelled, welcome home at this point, to which I jumped. And then she violently threw the boat in reverse. At this point, that's when I hit the pylon. So what happened first, the jump or the boat going in reverse? It was kind of simultaneous because the moment I got ready to jump, that's the reason why I smacked into this pylon because I lost my footing. Mr. Orlando, you can return to the boat. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Miss Martin, do you remember this day? Uh, yes, sir. What happened out there? I did have to come around those two boats and put it into that slip, which I was trying to do. Um, Had I you did... done that before, put your boat in that slip? Oh, sir, many, many, many times. I was um, backing up the boat, and um, 
I heard one of my crew members yell, man overboard. I faced the bow of the boat, so I knew that no one fell off the front, and so I did not see what happened. So immediately, I turned off my engines. I turned it over to my first mate. I ran down the steps, ran to the back of the boat, and Mr. Orlando was pulling himself up onto the dock at that time. Did you realize at that point whether or not he had been injured? I went directly over the dock and I asked him, I said, are you okay? Let's call the EMTs. She was I, not considerate at all, oh, Your Honor. Your no, honor. she wasn't. You were well, so what do you, what do you, remember? you did not Talk to me, Talk to me. She doesn't understand how traumatic this was. I had to stay on, on this boat and watch my husband almost drown. He was under the water. She did not stop immediately. She was still up there doing her captain thing or whatever. I don't really think she's a captain anyway. But anyhow, she stayed there and I had to watch my husband. I couldn't get to him. He had to pull himself up. You must have been pretty helpless. Yes, I mean, I was scared. This is the love of my life. Everything flashed before my eyes. Oh, like, please. she doesn't understand. He pulled himself up on the dock and I asked him, you know, are you okay? And he said he was fine and he got my my husband could have died. died on the Do you care about that at all? That my husband could have died? That's true. Talk he to me was negligent. He Talk could have. He could have been killed. Miss Martin, how does this kind of thing happen? I don't know. To be honest with you, I start out my um, my cruises every time with the same the same scenario. I always tell them, welcome aboard. I tell them that I hope they remember their sunscreen, their hats, their Dramamine, that they did not drink too much the night before. I also tell them I have a few safety rules. The rules are keep your limbs inside the boat. Whenever the boat is in motion, you must remain seated. The only time that um, you can get up is when the boat is tied to the dock. Mr. Orlando, Mrs. Orlando, if Miss Martin goes through this routine every time, do you all remember this happening when you I embarked on this boat? I don't recall hearing any of this information being No safety relayed. rules? You didn't hear any we of We had the safety meeting, but it was more like a safety briefing. It, it lasted no more than five minutes. So the main safety rule, though, that you point out... is to remain seated while the boat is in motion. Now, y'all understood that, though, right? right? I didn't hear that at all. Yeah, well, did, did thing... common sense kick in that the maybe you sit down while the boat's moving? The only thing that you wave. Your Honor. This is your boat. You put it in the slip. These folks are in your care. Bad injuries. Why wouldn't this be your fault? Because he was reckless, Your Honor. Reckless. The boat was not tied up. The gangplank not had not been reckless. lowered for him to get off the boat. We had not given them disembarking instructions, and they signed a waiver. Stating so, uh, that you all remember you signing a waiver? I don't remember signing a waiver at all, Your Honor. All right, That's Sheriff Matt, will you get the waiver? Let's look at it. Please do. Your Honor. Let me look at it first. All right, the, it says boat travel waiver. I see it says Nicole Orlando and Mark Orlando. And uh, both of y'all signed it, right? I didn't sign it. I didn't sign it at all. I wasn't even aware of a boat travel. Well, how'd your signature get on here? Yeah, I know that's not my signature. That's not your signature? That is not my signature. How did Mark Orlando and somebody's signature get on here? Well, my wife signs for me very often. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you're married, but I'm pretty sure you know that when wow. you become married, you're one. Well, wow. you know, that, that's an interesting legal point. Okay. Under the law, your wife can, under certain circumstances, sign for you. It's called a parent agency right. or a parent authority. Because of your marital relationship, people looking at her, knowing she's your wife, they can assume safely and lawfully that she will sign on your behalf. Right. You all are asking this court to give you $300,000 for pain and suffering. That's a lot of money. Tell me about the pain and suffering. Um, he was able to run marathons. He was able to continue his uh, personal fitness uh, program. Now he's not able to do that. Um, as far as us being able to provide for our family, we can't do that anymore. You're asking this court to award you $75,000 for your past medicals and $20,000 for future medicals. Right. Tell me about your injuries. Three broken ribs, cuts and abrasions. I've received uh, uh, actual collapsed lung on my left side. And it's very painful to deal with. It's, it prevents me from doing just about everything. So to further understand the nature of your injuries, this court has consulted Dr. Frieda McCray Fisher. Sheriff Matt, will you get Dr. McCray Fisher? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. 
Doctor, can you explain what a collapsed lung is? In the case of a rib fracture, if it punctures a hole in that lung, you get a collapsed lung. It's like puncturing and deflating a balloon and you get a pneumothorax. The pneumothorax is the fancy medical word for a collapsed lung. For a collapsed lung. Well, how do you treat a pneumothorax? You have to get this air out of the space and inflate the lung. And a needle would be inserted in between the ribs, into the chest wall, and you literally suck the air out of the chest wall. And the lung then inflates? It does after you go ahead and put a chest tube in. The chest tube is attached to a box which has suction. So then you're sucking out the air, the blood sometimes, and different fluid. And you keep this chest tube in until this collapsed lung reinflates into a normal lung. How does a puncture of the lung affect the lung long term? When this space has been violated, you are more likely to get a recurrent collapsed lung. Thank you, doctor. You are released from testimony. We appreciate you. Thank you. You do understand Ms. Martin's side, that you're the one that jumped off her boat. I couldn't completely understand if she had not been reckless herself throughout the entire boat trip. So she was doing reckless things during the, the fishing She thought Expedition. she was evil Knievel on, on water. That's Absolutely. what she thought she was. Now, y'all do know you're talking about a Navy veteran, right? Yeah, well, she doesn't act like it. I don't trust her nautical at skills all. at all. And I also have evidence of just how negligent the defendant is. And She's what, very what evidence is that? Well, actually, it's a speeding ticket. This so-called captain has had a speeding ticket and careless driving for the boat. Sheriff Matt, will you get the documents from Miss Orlando? So her 22 years of experience, I don't think so. Like I said, y'all, I don't trust. Well, let's look at what you got here. All right, so you've got one document that's boating violation notice. It says Nancy Martin. It's even your boat, Lorelei, uh, July 17th. Careless operation, speeding in restricted zone. They even fined you some pretty stiff fines. Do you remember this, Ms. Martin? Yes, Your Honor. And the circumstances of that day, it was late afternoon. I was taking my family out for a cruise, and there was a boat that was speeding toward us. I don't know if he had been drinking or what, but he did not look like he was going to stop. So, yes, I gunned my engines. Were you wrong? Um... Yes, sir, I was in the wrong. I take full responsibility for that. I paid my fine. They did not restrict my license. It is the only infraction I've ever got in my years in the military or as a civilian. Let me give you a legal lesson. While this is informative to me as to incidents in the past, these past incidents don't necessarily determine someone's fault in the case today. It lets me see what prior habits are. But because you were a bad driver on a day before today doesn't make you a bad driver today. I appreciate you giving this to me, but it's just one piece of the justice puzzle. Folks, I think I have heard enough. I'm ready to render my decision. <laughs> Folks, in every personal injury case, the plaintiff has to prove three things. You, Mr. Orlando, have to prove that Ms. Martin was wrong and that her wrong caused your injuries and other harm that you seek compensation for. Here, you've put up evidence that Ms. Martin was operating the boat crazy out there during the trip, that when you get into the slip, she says, welcome home. You think that means you've stopped and you feel the boat stop. But just as you're about to jump, she slams it in reverse and you jump and hit the pylon and now you and your family's lives have been changed and you want this court to hold her accountable. Yes, Your Honor. Honor. Ms. Martin, you believe that had he simply paid attention during the safety meeting, he would have known he should stay seated until the boat stops and he's given command to exit the boat. Had he followed the safety rules, he wouldn't have gotten hurt. You believe his injuries are because he jumped off too soon, took too big of a chance, and this is his fault. Yes. Well, this, uh, this case kind of shines light on two things. One is the importance of safety rules. Here, you all signed, whether your wife signed for you or you knew she was signing, you all were given an ample opportunity to know the safety rules. Now, safety rules are important because they inform us as to how we take care of ourselves, which is the second legal principle. 
That is personal safety. The law starts with the person. You have a responsibility to care for yourself, to act reasonably, to not take unreasonable risk. Here the evidence is, even if Miss Martin did put this boat in reverse, you already were unsafe trying to jump. You jumped to your peril and caused your own injuries. The evidence in this case commands me to find against you. And in your favor, Miss Martin, I find for the defendant. That's my final verdict, and this matter is again. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. A ship's captain is responsible for the safe operation of the boat and the care of the passengers. However, we all have a duty to act in a reasonable manner. Captain Martin had not announced that it was clear to disembark because she had not fully docked. Mr. Orlando tried to jump to the dock from a moving boat, assumed the risk, and collapsed his own lung. This is Personal Injury Court. This is Wilson versus Atkins. Miss Wilson, it's my understanding that you are suing Mr. Atkins for hitting your foot with a forklift and tearing part of it off. You are asking this court to award you $250,000 for past medical expenses, $150,000 for future medical expenses, $2 million for scarring and disfigurement, and $2.7 million for pain and suffering for a total award of $5.1 million. That's what you want, right? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Atkins, it's your position she shouldn't have been there, and if she had been responsible, this would have never happened. Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. Now, Ms. Wilson, why'd you file this lawsuit? I started working. I went into shipping, a warehouse shipping, and six months ago, I was promoted as supervisor in a male-dominant area. Women are changing the world, getting we into are. the guys' stuff. We are. We are. <laughs> You're enjoying it? I love it. So, uh, Mr. Atkins, tell me about your job. What do uh, you do? I'm a truck driver. Truck driver been in the family for the longest of times. You know, my grandpappy did it. My dad did it, and now I'm doing it. Two of my brothers are truck drivers. Oh, that's great. You deliver things, I take it? Yes. What we, kinds uh, of things do you deliver? We deliver whatever a client may need. We, do, we work for about 50 companies. Okay. Uh, we transport to over 100 locations. So, Ms. Wilson, what went wrong here? I am looking over my inventory, making sure everything is correct. No one is in the warehouse but me. Why would that be? Is it a break or something? Yes. All my employees are going on break. Okay. That's when I know there's no machinery on. It's no reason for any... Nothing to be going wrong at this point because I'm the only one there. Your Honor... First, I'd like to say, why would you have all your employees at lunch at the same time? Okay. It's a time schedule. How so, Ms. Wilson, and I, and I because of your personal that agenda. Simply because like, why are you doing that? I'm Look how much time that you're wasting safety. by doing this. Mr. Atkins, talk to me. So, Ms. Wilson, tell me what happened. As I'm in the warehouse and I'm going through my stuff and I'm stepping back, and as I'm going back, I get this, this sharp pain into my left heel where he is on my forklift and slants into my left heel. Oh. I'm down. I'm on the ground. Did you know you had struck her, her leg or her foot? I felt a little bump, and I seen it in there, and as soon as I seen it, I caught and Is got she down her. on the uh, She's concrete? She's down on the ground, yeah. You remember this, obviously, Ms. Wilson. Yes, I was down. I was screaming. I was in pain. I've never in my life felt this type of pain before, ever. So there's no one really around but you and Mr. Atkins Correct. at this point. So then what do you do? I blacked out. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. Mr. Atkins, do you remember this, this incident? Yes, Your Honor. Tell I... me how this happened from your perspective. So this is a company that I've been working with for four years now. Okay. So, so basically what you do, you pick up a load... Yes. Sir. ...and then you deliver it to the warehouse. Yes. Right? When you get to the warehouse, is there a certain routine that you go through to the... deliver your load? It's always you get there drop your load off to somebody, they take care of it, but sometimes they can't take care of it. So, because I'm certified and driving a forklift, they, they gave me the okay to go ahead and do it. So, Ms. Wilson, on this day, when Mr. Atkins brought his load, what was he supposed to do? Um, Your Honor, he's supposed to wait on staff. 
He's supposed to wait on them because they are the ones that help unload the truck. And when he gets out of his truck, he's supposed to sign his name, time, and date, and that's when I will come and I will signature off showing that he did come and make the drive. And then once he completes the paperwork, your staff grabs the forklift and unloads the truck with your forklift. Yes, sir. Mr. Atkins, you actually went in and got the forklift yourself. Yes, I did. The manager, previous manager, told me that I had the authorization to do that. So to be clear, you knew about the policy. Yes, I did. Folks told you you could do it another way. That's why he got fired, the other supervisor, because of the situation of him coming in and doing what he wanted to do. It didn't work that way. So how's he supposed to know that we're doing it differently? This has been a rule that's been going on before I even became supervisor. But, it, but he said for years he's been allowed to do this. Why that's wouldn't right. he just do it the same way? No, sir, not on my watch. Because safety is my protocol and that's what I'm going by. If they can't get with it, then... then... And, and so, what happened to your foot? I have a hole in my foot this big, in my heel. They had to take muscle out of my left thigh to place inside of my heel to try to give me somewhat of a balance. Yes, ma'am. But it would never be the same because I'll forever have, like, a limp. I would have hip problems. I mean, my whole life is completely shattered. I can never wear heels again. Yes, I've done all kind of stuff. I used to travel. I have children. Yes, ma'am. You can still you know? travel. And I, I have all these... I have responsibilities. My husband is sick. I'm the breadwinner in my family. Yes, ma'am. You know, and Well, so... to further understand your injuries, I want to call Dr. Darren Newfield to explain this injury from a medical perspective. <laughs> Sheriff, if you'll get Dr. Newfield. Yes, Your Honor. Doctor, for the record, state your name. Dr. Darren Newfield. And what kind of doctor are you? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Doctor, tell us the nature and severity of Ms. Wilson's injury. Well, she sustained an injury to her calcaneus, which is the heel bone. This image shows her calcaneus and the multiple bones that were fractured. So this forklift basically took her heel off. Yeah, we call it a crush injury because it's not just an injury to the bones. There's also a significant injury to the soft tissues around the heel. The muscles, the tendons, the nerves, the arteries can be involved. And so with a crush injury, our biggest worry in the beginning is for infection. Okay. And so we have to take the person to surgery multiple times usually to wash out the heel, remove any debris from the forklift or from her shoes. And then then she's left with a big soft tissue defect. Is, is it accurate to call this a life-changing injury? Oh, well, this, yeah, this is a life-altering injury, definitely. Sometimes if the injury is severe, we do a below-knee amputation if you can't salvage the foot. The physician who did her surgery yes, sir. actually was able to salvage the foot. In order to f fill in this soft tissue defect, they took skin and soft tissue and muscle from her thigh to cover the heel soft tissue defect. Miss Wilson, how are you able to get around now? It's, I'm sorry, I get very emotional because this is like a super life-changing moment. Yes, ma'am. I see that you brought a scooter. Yes, is, sir. is that something you have to use every day? I do, constantly. C can you show me how this uh, scooter helps you get around? Um, with it, I have to put my left leg into it and I have to move, move carefully around and I have to go like this. I mean, and it takes time, especially if you have to go to the restroom. So, so moving around your house, you have to use this scooter? Yes. I don't go to the stores because to me it's embarrassing. I don't want to be out like this. So, Ms. Wilson, the back of your heel was basically torn off. Correct. Now, I see you've got that boot on. Have you tried to wear shoes? I can't, and the reason why I can't is because of the heel. It's not healed completely, in which it'll probably never will be. Doctor, what, what's the future like for Ms. Wilson with this kind of injury? Well, it, it takes six months to a year f to just heal from the injury. The first six months, usually, you can't put your foot on the ground. There's no weight bearing. And in the second six months, that's when you do a lot of rehab and therapy just to try to regain as much function as possible. So is this scooter a lifetime apparatus for her? It may or may not be, depending on how much she can recover. She clearly has long-term deficits with her foot and ankle. It'll never be the same. She'll never be able to wear normal shoes. Will she be able to walk naturally? Maybe she could just wear flats or something like that. Well... Oh! Yes.
So don't be so insensitive about this. Uh, Your Honor, I, This I'm is not... an injury that you caused. Look at that. You cannot be callous about that. Our society puts a lot of pressure on women to be beautiful and perfect. You clearly can't be perfect. You still are a beautiful woman, but this has got a way on your mind. Tell me about that. It's, it's very emotional. And actually, I do some therapy sections because it has messed with me emotionally. I see here in, in that you're seeking $2 million for permanent scarring and disfigurement. Your, your foot is disfigured, isn't it? Yes, sir. I see also that you're asking this court to award you $2.7 million for pain and suffering. I imagine this never leaves your mind. It doesn't. This, is, this has re really been a life change experience for me. I also see that you have $150,000 for future medical expenses. Yes. Doctor, is that reasonable? Is that what she's looking at? I, it's, it's a reasonable amount, I would assume. She could have multiple more surgeries on this foot and ankle if it, she can save it. Sometimes we save it in the beginning, in the first couple of years, and then the patient ultimately goes on to a below-knee amputation. So she may be facing an amputation. She still could lose this. Foot. If they're professionals, they should be able to save it. <laughs> so you're a doctor well, now. Well, I, I'm not a doctor, but... I so you like should... If you, wow. if Mr. Atkins, that title, Mr. Atkins, wow. I'm not going to talk over you. Wow. You are not a doctor, and you have not gone to medical school, but let me take you to law school. <laughs> When you are operating a forklift, you must do so responsibly, I... not because you did it irresponsibly 1,500 times before. Every time, you must take care. I see from your passion that you believe you did, but stay in your lane. Doctor, you may be released. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Atkins, you've seen the diagrams, you've yes. heard the testimony, yes, you've Honor. heard the doctor. Yes, Your Honor. You still just say, look, this is not my fault. See, again, Your Honor, I don't say that this isn't my fault. In the terms of me doing my job, I feel like I did what I did right. I did everything I needed to do. I feel like she was in the wrong place at the wrong time when the accident occurred. Tell me why you think that she was in the wrong place. The reason I feel like she's in the wrong place because, you know, she talks about how she... She cleared it out. No one should be in there. If you work in a factory, this is a known fact from any company anywhere that you should not be close to that danger zone at any time because you never know when someone will be operating a vehicle. Now, at you all. say a danger zone. You can go to the monitor. You can tell me why you say that's a danger zone. If you look right here, this is the danger zone. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, she walked backwards. If you're at a factory job, why would you walk backwards? There's danger at any moment of time, no matter who you are, whether you're a supervisor who tells all your employees to leave or whether that everyone was self-aware. You have to be on your toes, male or woman. It doesn't matter. Your instinct has to be intact whenever you are in a factory. Miss Wilson, is that a danger zone where you should have stayed out? It is a danger zone, but I normally always keep the area clear. But no it matter what, no matter if it's clear or not, it is always told to take precaution and always look where you're going when you're walking. That's common sense, y'all. You may return to the podium. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, do you admit that this was a pathway that is usually kept clear for safety reasons? Yes, Your Honor, I can. I mean, forklifts aren't really like tricycles. They make noise. They've got beepers. You can hear them. Why wouldn't you hear this forklift? On that day, because it's so loud in the warehouse, and I actually have... And to point out, my Your Honor, safety I, headphones. I was just talking to her. It's okay. I, I will get to you. I promise. I have my safety headphones, in which we have these. So you had those on this day? Yes, sir, I did. Are those noise canceling? Why do you have those on? Because of the noise in the warehouse. Sheriff Matt, will you retrieve those uh, headphones from Miss Wilson? I want to see them. Now, I'm going to put these on, Matt, and I want you to talk to me as loud as you see fit so I can see what this noise canceling is about. Now, when I point to you, Matt, I want you to talk to me. That green's a great color on you, Judge. <laughs> Say something again a little louder. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I see how this would muffle your sound. With these on, you prevent you an opportunity to hear him. I would expect no one to be there. And again, if someone had come to the dock and whatnot, and they did what they're supposed to do by ringing the bell, it would alert me. Nobody has done that. But if you cleared it, 
then you shouldn't even have to worry about it being super loud because it was cleared. Everyone was on lunch. I think I've heard what I need to hear, folks. I'm ready to render my decision. <laughs> In every personal injury case, the plaintiff, you, Ms. Wilson, have to prove that Mr. Atkins was wrong and that his wrong caused your injuries. You've had your heel torn off. You didn't know this was gonna happen. When you figured it out, you were already in the heart of tragedy. Unfortunately, the law doesn't just look at your injury, it looks at everything. It looks at whether Mr. Atkins was wrong. Now, Mr. Atkins, you didn't expect she'd be in the safety zone. No, Your you Honor. You certainly didn't expect she'd be walking backwards with headphones on. No, Your Honor. But her actions don't absolve you of the responsibility to be safe. Now, part of being safe is to abide by the rules, and the rules require that you get some of her folks, I'm speaking right now, that you get some of her folks to help with this forklift, and this may not have happened. Here, I find, Ms. Wilson, that you proved that Mr. Atkins was wrong. He should have waited, because it would have been safer. Because he was wrong, this injury is his fault. And I find that you are entitled to $250,000 for past medical expenses, $150,000 for future medical expenses, every penny of $2 million for permanent scarring and disfigurement, and I'm giving you $2.7 million for your pain and suffering for a total award of $5.1 million. It's my family business, and this... Oh, my... That is my final award, and this matter is adjourned. <laughs> Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Chad Dudley has to say. Now, that injury was gruesome. In this case, Miss Wilson's injuries were caused by someone other than a coworker. Some people don't realize that if you're hurt at work, and your injury was caused by a person other than your employer or a coworker, you may have a right to sue them for personal injuries in addition to pursuing a workers' compensation claim. 